So welcome to the second episode of Coastal Reflections. So if you haven't heard the first one, this is where I basically just go past the uh, five episodes um, that I've chatted to people and I basically just uh, summarise and take away some key points that I've uh, taken from the conversation. So uh, this one I'm going to keep pretty brief um, and... Yeah, uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the email. Uh, you can keep up to date with all the episodes I'm releasing. And uh, yeah, you can do that at the website at coastalcatchups.com. So, without uh, further ado, um, yeah, I'll jump into it here. It's all about Marie and the coastal sea. What it like and everything in between So sit on down hey, and take a seat Coastal catch ups with a sampy So episode six was with Rihanna who works for the Scottish Seaweed Industry Association. We talked about the change in perception on seaweed throughout history. So in particular, looking at how it went from being a staple of coastal communities, uh, being a major food source, then, and also being used in agriculture as well for fertilizer, then also kind of taking a backward step in society and kind of coming out of the limelight and not really being used and maybe the (laughs) stigma of... uh, don't know if stigma is the right word, but you know, of looking at um, people not really taking much notice of it, then I feel like it's now coming back in the the limelight now being used as um, uh, in beauty products, uh, foods, um, you know, supplements, you know, all that sort of thing. So I feel like it's coming back into play. So Rihanna's role was from what I gathered from conversation was connecting the dots of the supply chain so from actually producing uh, high quality seaweed to getting it in the high quality products then connecting it to consumers so it it was a really interesting conversation and I think it's a fact that the supply chain is growing but it's maybe growing in different parts so production has I've read it's more than doubled between 2014 in the UK, um, um, but well, or that's been, uh, you know, transferred up the supply chain um, to the consumer. I'm not sure, uh, so it's a good one to keep an eye on. Um, I thought it'd be cool to maybe get uh, coastal catch up T-shirts made out of seaweed material. That would be a real. Uh, um, a real commitment to the seaweed cause um, so watch this space I might get that organized for the future uh, the UK has lots of ideal conditions for growing seaweed um, well in the case of Scotland it's in the case of locks so you know we have uh, high dynamic water bodies and the nutrients can come in and out of, out of the area um, and lots of light as well so uh, there's plenty of areas around the UK that are ideal for growing and farming seaweed if you're interested in becoming part of the supply chain, make sure you give Rihanna a shout. I'm sure she would be more than happy to uh, um, to help. Um, if you haven't already, um, if you want to find out more, you can listen to episode six of Coastal Catch-Ups. Episode seven then was with Mary from the Royal Yachting Association, also known as RYA. Um, I love that episode because it was the first one I was able to do on my Draskum Lugger. Now we're coming into winter, it'll probably be the last one I'll be able to do outside, but sure, um, it was nice to do it anyway. Um, one of the key things I chatted to Mary about was getting more women on the water. 83% of women said they would return to the water and physical health was the main restricting factor of them doing so. So it showed, this figure came from the RAA survey that they completed of women around uh, Northern Ireland and it, it shows there's a keenness for women to get involved in the water but 
uh, possibly, well, if they're saying physical health, it's probably age is a restricting factor, but um, from what we chatted with Mary is, uh, there's lots of different types of uh, ways people can get on the water. It doesn't have to necessarily be all action packed. It can be there's like uh, boots that are quite low, uh, it can be sailed by anyone uh, at any age. It's not that physically demanding, which is good. Um, so there is opportunity, but it's making those opportunities aware to these people uh, and make them uh, give them a confidence to get involved in clubs and um, uh, all the rest. So uh, RYA's focus is obviously on sailing, um, and it was clear from the conversation that sailing and from my own personal experience it is dominated by men so it was it was really good f for me to um, hear the reasons why women are not getting on the water um, and such a, it, that includes childcare and uh, lack of confidence like I already said there it seems to me that ro role models would be very useful um, you know showing women that other women can do this you know you probably know yourself there's women who'll just uh, get stuck in, not hold back, uh, they're very confident and I think those are the women you need to highlight and maybe uh, use them to inspire other women to get involved. So that's just my personal opinion, um, but I think that's one of the good ways to get more women on the water. But uh, of course our way are doing their programs and uh, encouraging participation through the Women in Water program. So if you want, um, if you're interested in getting involved you should check out their website um, or you can get in touch with Mary. So episode 8 was with Cliff Henry from the Giants Causeway who works as a nature engagement officer for the National Trust. Uh, I had actually met Cliff before he had helped me with my dissertation um, when I was studying uh, geography at Queen's University um, and we were looking at slope failures on the site um, and how likely they would increase with climate change. Now we don't touch on that um, really in our uh, chat probably because um, we didn't want to scare anyone away but um, the, uh, that is a reality of the site. It's a very dynamic site so it was really interesting to see how, to hear how a site like that is managed um, particularly due to the um, increasing tourist numbers on the site. I think over a million visitors were recorded within the year in 2018 so it just shows you how uh, much footfall there is on the site and um, causing soil erosion. Um, the site is also unique in the sense that it has a rare snail. I uh, can't even remember the name of the snail but um, it's rare nonetheless. But there are lots of volunteering opportunities at the causeway and also activities to engage young members of the local community uh, which in my view is vital for sustainable conservation and getting the next generation involved uh, like I've said in other episodes so it's really good to see those activities um, going on in the Giants Causeway um, organised by Cliff. So if you want to get involved with Cliff in the Giants Causeway, um, you can give him a shout. I'm sure he'd be happy to have you. Um, and yeah, a couple of other things to take away from that chat was if you're visiting, um, I mentioned about the soil erosion, st stick to the footpaths on the site. Um, the, the site is managed in a way that it keeps, uh, they try and keep uh, people on the paths and not damage any habitat outside of the path so uh, make sure you stick to the paths if you're venturing up uh, but above, above all enjoy it if you do go up it's a brilliant site um, to visit. Episode 9 uh, Hammy was with Hammy Baker he is a professional sailor he is now back home here in Northern Ireland working for the RYA his name is Mary Martin but uh, Hammy had a, a stint as a professional sailor, so it was really interesting to hear about how he uh, got into that job and uh, the process behind it and, and then actually what it involved. So um, it started off, he was working in the south of England and got selected to become part of a uh, special team and 
then that went on to he raced yachts solo, so on his own, um, offshore, and he had, well, that brings a whole load of challenges such as uh, the navigation in the dark, which you hear about his stories with dodging rocks and then also uh, how to stay awake and simplifying the decision making process. Uh, so I think if I could, yeah, I was thinking I could maybe use that in my own day to day life. And <laughs> if I'm hungry, eat. If I'm not, sleep. Uh, keep it really simple. Um, but yeah, and then we talked about the challenges of being away from home and it, the job is well paid, but there's a regular pay. So he said about challenges of coming home and trying to get a house and all, which uh, it was quite interesting to hear because. I suppose jobs like that you hear about the glamorous side, but it's always good to hear about the real, uh, the real side of things like that. Um, and yeah, and then also uh, he said he had had grown up on Strangford Lock, um, same place uh, where I've grown up. And he said there's, there's at the end it was quite nice. He said there's no place like home. So uh, yeah, that was a good chat with Hamid and insight to his career. Um, and yeah, so maybe some of the chat has inspired some of you to chase a life of professional sailing. Uh, if so, let me know. I'll get you on for a coastal catch up. Um, the last episode, episode 10, was with uh, Ryan O'Leary. He is a dedicated surfer um, and general, very talented water sportsman um, and his pl- he had big plans to head around the world in search of uh, the perfect wave which is such a cliche um, sorry for that um, but that's what he's doing so he has bought an old yacht which he is restoring and he is um, going to sail around the world um, that's a plan anyway um, and just sail and surf so uh, yeah, I, I wish I had the balls to do that. Um, so, a lot of respect to Ryan. He is, well, in the chat, he gives a good insight into the surfing community and around Ireland and what it means to him in terms of his friend group and um, how they support each other and look out for each other. Uh, I also enjoyed him. He, he talked about the actual the professionalism of it as well in terms of risk assessments and safety. I think a lot of people associate surfing with just uh, being crazy, but there's a lot of thought that goes behind um, b- behind each uh, each surf they do. You know, if 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 it's they kind of do a risk assessment, then you know they know for first aid if things go wrong, which is really important. Uh, it, Ryan also mentioned about ways to get into surfing and uh, about getting checking out courses ne- next year. Um, it's a really nice way to get out in nature and um, get in the water and uh, kind of switch off from life and you know any other problems you may have. So uh, yeah, I'd recommend. Uh, giving it a go if you haven't already so Ryan also sells fresh oysters in a van with his friend so if you need a, a, a van that sells oysters for any upcoming events you may have and um, make sure to give him a shout so yeah I want to wish Ryan all the best with his um, work on the boat and getting his dream plan uh, pulled together and um, I'm excited to see um, where he ends up so that's all uh, That's all the episodes. I think that's pretty short. I can't see the timer anymore, but hopefully it's uh, about 10-15 minutes. Um, I kept it short because I'm uh, severely jet-lagged here. And I have COVID and I'm struggling to pull a sentence together if you haven't, if you haven't noticed already um, by listening. Um, I just I'm reading a book at the minute called Rewilding the Sea by Charles Clover. So if I'm looking forward to reading that actually. If you've read it, um love to hear what you think of it. Um, um what else is going on at the minute? 
I read a book by Al Manny recently as well. Um, I don't know why I'm talking about books now. Maybe I'm going delirious. Um, it was... Al is a big wave surfer based in Northern Ireland on the North Coast. Um, and he wrote a book about his life during the COVID uh, lockdown and how the sea and uh, sea swimming helped him uh, get through it. Um, and then he also went on to raise a load of money, in fact, over £20,000, swimming over 100 kilometres during the coldest months of the year. Um, so, yeah, a really, really inspiring story of um, Al's life during lockdown and how he turned um, a quite a dark period for everyone in the um, quite a special time. So, uh, yeah, um, that book is called uh, Escape to the Wild Dark Sea by Al Manny. Um And then I also finished one by Sammy Reeve, uh, Journeys to Impossible Places. I don't know why this turned into a book review. I just have these notes here written down, so I just thought I'd talk through them as well. Hope you don't mind. Um, there was a chapter in that book about when he was viewing um, there was a area in the ocean. I'll, I'll not say I think it was in the Indian Ocean, um, but it was a point that it, he was talking about overfishing, and basically, uh, I'll just quote it here: when the net was back in the boat, it only contained a few shrimps and a small amount of bycatch. Unwanted sea life caught alongside the target catch. Much of a bike catch is chucked away dead, including juvenile fish that have no chance to breed. But what really shocked me was that the overall catch was so pitifully small. Here, after years of overfishing the area, the ocean was almost empty. Um, and I think it's just a highlight of the actual issues that the ocean is and our coasts are facing. It's kind of take, 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 and it's not... Um, I was listen. I was watching a video on YouTube there of a guy Brody Brody Moss, and his idea is like using selective fishing, so targeting only particular species that are healthy. Um, now, how you do that on a large scale to feed a population, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, but I suppose if you start small and, and work up, that's um, you're you're on the track to solution. Uh, but by targeting healthy species that can uh, breed very quickly, you're not um, you're removing all this bycatch that is being chucked away dead, um, and you're you're not creating dead zones in the ocean. Um, I think that's a I think that's a term dead zones. Pretty sure I must have read that somewhere. Um, but yeah, uh, the likes of Simon saying there that the juvenile juvenile fish should should have a chance to breed, don't, um, and then you're just wiping out a, a, a generation of species. Um, so, yeah, that was uh, that was Simon Reeve's book. There's a couple of other observations in his book that were quite interesting, but sure, I'll save them for another time. Um, in terms of my plans for the next couple of weeks, I am going to um, try and get a couple of interviews done, and I, I'm in Australia at the minute, I'll try and get a couple of interviews with people um, down here. I, um, I'm not going to push it too hard. If if I don't get one out, I've been getting episodes out weekly at the minute. If I might go down to, I don't know, maybe twice a month. Maybe um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to get too hung up about it. Hope you guys appreciate that. I'm on my holiday, so uh, if I can get some quick conversations with people. Um, I will, but if not, uh, sure, I'll I'll wait till I get back to the lovely people of uh, Ireland and the UK um, and get chatting with them. So that's all for me uh, on Coastal Reflections. Um, if you've made it this far, thank you very much for listening um, and I'll catch you soon.